Hello, Dr. Nicholas. Thank you for jumping on the Crypto Kid podcast. So what's your background and how did you get into cryptocurrency? Um, hi, and thanks for having me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was actually involved in the space before even the invention of Bitcoin. And that was actually due to my research interests at the university. So I'm a computer scientist. I did my PhD and postdoc at Stanford University. And my interests are in distributed systems, which is essentially what the blockchain is. The precursor to blockchain existed many years before. And social computing, which is related to human computer interaction and crowdsourcing. So uh, as part of my master's thesis, I created a framework for writing smart contracts on fault-tolerant distributed systems. Uh, And of course, back then it wasn't called smart contracts and it wasn't called the blockchain, but it was similar concepts. Um, And then, as part of my postdoc, I introduced and taught uh, a class at Stanford University uh, at the computer science department there, uh, the CS359B, which was teaching students how to design decentralized applications on blockchain. And now in this class, students created uh, and deployed uh, multiple functional working prototypes of decentralized applications, but they all got stuck in having people to use them. Uh, And that's mostly because many reasons, uh, but uh, user experience related reasons on blockchain back then. But um, one core uh, blocking point was that before anyone can use any of those apps, they needed to acquire cryptocurrency to pay for the gas fees. now, at Stanford is also where I got to meet my other uh, founder uh, of Pi, uh, Chen Yao Fan, where she also did her PhD there as well. And it's uh, our academic career and personal interests that uh, is what truly led to uh, create the Pi Network, which we founded uh, at the end of 2018. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And hey, I got a chance to watch a lecture of yours on YouTube. You explaining how blockchain technology works. There's just so much to learn about it. and. I really appreciate you taking on that challenge in, in um, developing young minds to get involved with the future, especially something that has to do with money, governance and law later on down. Yeah, thanks for saying this. I, I really try when I try to explain something, I try to uh, look at what what is the audience. So when I am uh, uh, teaching to CS students, uh, The audience is more technical, but when I'm trying to explain something that is for the general uh, population, I'm trying to start from really ground zero. (laughs) Keep pushing, man. You're doing a great job. Now, we're going to talk about Pi Network. And what is unique about Pi Network compared to other blockchains coming out and other cryptocurrencies? What makes you, you guys different? Yeah, so so Pi Network is essentially a massive open community with over 35 million engaged members. And this community is powered by Pi, which is the world's most widely distributed cryptocurrency. So this platform that we're putting together is essentially creating a, a robust, especially accessible ecosystem for three types of people, for users, for developers who are building apps and for merchants who are using apps. And uh, what makes it different? Um, I would say that uh, uh, we follow the number of uh, uh, non-consensus strategies compared to other cryptocurrencies. Uh, Like, for example, we didn't uh, just focus on solving a technical problem. Sometimes you hear things like, uh, transactions per second and this and that technical uh, s- solutions uh, but we also focused on uh, solving the human problems so having people engaged having people on the platform to begin with uh, another thing that we did differently is that uh, uh, we we don't our platform is not just focusing on blockchain native applications and nothing else meaning like DeFi, NFT, of course, these are possible on Pi, but this is the, not the only thing that the platform is focuses. It focuses on all types of applications that uh, that, that solve needs uh, for mainstream audience. Um, let me see. Uh, another another different, different thing that we did slightly different here is that uh, we focused on accessibility and ex- inclusivity 
through essentially trying to reduce any kind of barriers for, for people to participate, such as financial barriers and technical barriers. So financially, we don't ask them to pay for anything to acquire Pi. In fact, it's not even possible for someone to, to do that. You can only mine it uh, on the platform. And technical barriers, they don't need to be computer scientists or uh, have uh, complicated uh, mining rigs at home that, uh, like, that are uh, allowing them to mine. All they need is a mobile phone and, uh, and uh, participate use, using. Amazing. Yeah, there's like so many mining farms out there. And it's crazy how much it, it can damage the ecosystem, in my opinion. And we, we definitely need more room for improvement and protecting the environment. And that's a great way. And plus, you have a you have literally have a computer in, in the palm of your hand. So and more and more people, the phone is so easy to use, a kid could navigate it. So that's just, you're going to get like, 10 year olds learning how to mine cryptocurrencies and then met them making more money than their parents. It's amazing. So what is, what will the KS or KYC solutions help the pioneers? How will it help the pioneers? Ha, huh, so how will it help? And uh, I, um, first of all, uh, Pi is a, from the beginning, we're, building it as a fully compliant uh, platform uh, we are we're here we are uh, uh, our identities are known mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we wanted it to as part of compliance uh, these services these uh, networks uh, need to uh, do something called kyc so kyc is know your customer stands for um, know your customer and it was initially used in traditional businesses so in this case uh, in a blockchain the word customer doesn't make a lot of sense but uh, I guess uh, we're going with it uh, so the need for KYC is for compliance purposes um, and but also for um, the ability to uh, have a more valuable ecosystem so if you remember from uh, the maybe what is it now, 10, 20 years ago when social networks started existing. There was a bunch of social networks before Facebook that were uh, all composed of fake users and fake accounts and every cat and dog had their own uh, uh, profile on the, on the social network. And then Facebook came along and it was the first one that was saying, no, we want real users. We want real uh, people, real faces, real names. That was unheard of on the internet before that uh, because everybody was still afraid of putting the real name on the internet uh, and and yet what happened is that it changed it shifted the whole world's uh, uh, mentality and uh, people started using the internet for a lot more useful uh, purposes in the same thing now with blockchain the first generation was uh, oh let's use it for anonymity but that didn't work out very well and it doesn't pr produce as useful utility as it uh, would have and uh, uh, now the second generation is uh, the one that is uh, um, based on real identity and actually this is how you can, uh, you're able to create uh, true uh, useful applications on top of uh, blockchains. Now Pi created its own KYC solution, I'm happy to <laughs> tell you about it as well. But Yeah, I remember when Facebook, when Facebook was out and the way that they would um, weed out the uh, fake users is you had to message like 10 people to make sure that you're actually ruined. It was just like such a process and it was kind of annoying. I was just, I didn't like it. But when Facebook came out, it was just so much easier and actually better. So I think blockchain is will be better in the future. And as more people get involved with it and start understanding the technology, you'll see a lot more use cases in it. And what was I going to say? Yeah, that's pretty much it. And so why was accessibility an important factor for developing Pi Network? Well, um, accessibility is very important. Um, any successful currency that wants to support a real ecosystem with utilities relies on a large social network because uh, uh, in order for you to have uh, 
true utility, you need to have many people recognize uh, the, the cryptocurrency and uh, are able to uh, own it and uh, they are willing to transact goods and services with that currency. Uh, so the size of a crypto network uh, essentially needs to hit an inflection point for real utilities and markets to form. Uh, and that's the, the, that after this inflection point, we will be able to have network effects. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just remembered what I was going to say earlier. Blockchain technology, back to that, blockchain technology is like the internet of the 90s. Okay. So that's what I just wanted to say. And you also made a great point with the accessibility. And what does this mean for the future of mining on mobile phones? So I think that uh, you, the use it, in order for you to have a useful um, cryptocurrency, uh, you, you can't think uh, 2009. So uh, Bitcoin was uh, great because it uh, proved to the world that cryptocurrencies exist and uh, it is possible to have a decentralized ledger that is maintaining the an accurate uh, the essentially accurately maintains the balances of different people uh, because before that you would need a, a centralized bank to tell you what your true balance is and with bitcoin we, we the proof of concept of a decentralized bank essentially uh, is possible uh, but um, uh, that was 2009 and people were using computers and it was a little slow and it had a, it's consuming a lot of energy as we all say and it, it's block takes 10 minutes but um, in to, today you know if you want to have a, a cryptocurrency that is functional and useful to everyday people it needs to be on mobile mm -hmm. <laughs> it needs to be more uh, um, faster and more accessible so to answer your question, I think that uh, it is the future. Uh, mobile, it has to be mobile. Mm -hmm. Just like just like the metaverse, everybody is pretty yeah. soon. You do you teach class from home? I uh, uh, my primary job is uh, building Pi Network, but it just happens that uh, every year uh, since I left uh, Stanford, I have 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 been invited to. Uh, co-instruct uh, one of the blockchain classes over at Stanford. It's not official, but it just every year they, it just happens that they invite me again. <laughs> so I teach the technical lectures in that class and uh, other um, uh, instructors teach uh, non-technical uh, aspects. Okay, okay. I like it. I like it. Now, what are the stages of verification? I know sometimes it can be a little bit complex with the authenticator and it can it can be kind of tedious to some people so the stages of authenticity can you um, maybe help me understand your question a little more like the, you... like um <laughs> how do you, how to access the the cryptocurrencies or the oh. coins so the pi are you talking about yeah, the, pi? yeah, yeah <laughs> to like I, um how do i say to make sure the person that's actually accessing it is actually them, not in, and not some hacker from across the other side of the world. Ah, uh, yeah, there are two questions here. I guess uh, one is about the user and one other one is about uh, consensus algorithm. I, I think you're more interested about the user. So, um, the so Pi has two uh, levels. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, for the past few years, people have been mining it through a mobile app. So. On that mobile app, uh, they have been accumulating Pi as, uh, let's say, um, tokens. And uh, these are not the, um, the, these are the tokens that are going to be moved, migrated into the mainnet blockchain and has been migrating. We have actually already migrated over uh, two and a half something million people into the uh, mainnet blockchain. So for these two systems, there is essentially two different ways of authenticating yourself. So for the mobile app uh, system, we use a traditional uh, username, password, uh, or you can have uh, Facebook sign in and a few other Apple sign in and a few other uh, ways to, to authenticate yourself. Uh, now for the 
actual blockchain, which is what happens after you KYC and your balance is migrated from, from the app into the blockchain, the actual blockchain, we use uh, um, non-custodial uh, wallets. That's a mouthful, but <laughs> for, the, for the audience who, uh, who may not know what this means, it, it means that uh, they, uh, the users will have to remember a passphrase and that passphrase is enough to fully authenticate themselves. And no one else knows that passphrase uh, to the point that uh, if someone were to hack it, theoretically, without stealing it from you using a virus, if they were to actually hack it and hack uh, SATO 56, it would take them 100 billion years to do, do it using computational uh, uh, methods. Of course, they can try to, steal, to, to deceive you, to give you, to give them your passphrase, which is a different uh, problem. It's a user experience problem, but uh, in terms of um, uh, cryptography, it's uh, very strong. So essentially, uh, like um, in the proper way uh, all cryptocurrencies are supposed to do it, uh, is through um, uh, non-custodial wallets. So the users have to remember this passphrase. Now, because this passphrase is a little difficult to remember, we ask the users to save it on um, somewhere safe, and uh, we help them use the phone's uh, uh, biometric features, such as the thumbprint or the facial scan, mm -hmm. to essentially load up this uh, passphrase using their phone's uh, um, algorithms. And there are some phones, some depending on uh, uh, companies, I guess, uh, you can tell that uh, uh, these days uh, most phones are doing a pretty good job at uh, securing those, uh, those data.